lots of beautiful sessions. Um, I can see that you know I've gathered a lot of information over the last two days, and it's been an information overload. So what I'm going to try to do now is uh, keep it light. I've designed the slides uh, in such a way that I keep it light. Uh, so my uh, session subject today is bringing order to innovation. So what is innovation? Uh, Nikola Tesla was a young scientist who traveled after his education in Serbia. He traveled to New York to pursue a career in, uh, in science. And he's known to have uh, invented the alternating current. And he's done some amazing work in magnetism. And uh, he's also done some initial designs in the radar technology that we use today. He was a geek and a genius and, and, and a lot of respect for him. And he was an amazing scientist, basically. Thomas Alva Edison, on the other hand, was a businessman. Now, if you look him up on Wikipedia, it says an inventor and a businessman. He's known to have invented the incandescent bulb. Uh, and uh, and he's, he's got a lot of uh, patents in his name. The reality is he did not invent the incandescent bulb uh, on multiple levels, really. So he was the owner of a company called uh, Thomas A. Edison, Inc. And he, he had uh, about 75 to 85 scientists working for him who used to do all his inventions. And uh, he used to patent them. Now, that sounds a little bad, saying that, OK, somebody else is doing the inventions, and he's keeping the patents. But you can't really take the credit away from him, because he put a process around innovation. The innovations or the inventions that were happening were happening on a deadline. He had a fixed number of inventions that he expected from all the scientists that were working for him. They used to work 20 hours in a day, sleeping only four hours in a day, working really hard at inventing new things. While uh, Nikola Tesla had about 271 patents in his name. I don't know the exact number. Uh, Thomas Alva Edison had over 1,000 patents in his name. Now, if you do a little bit of research, uh, you find that Thomas Alva Edison looks like a villain. Because he used to electrocute animals, showing that alternating current is not a good thing. It's a dangerous thing. And DC or uh, direct current is a, is a better option. Nikola Tesla was a genius. He actually changed how we electrocute the entire world. He's, the way we uh, electrocute our buildings today is alternating current. But he was just an inventor. There's another thing that Thomas Alva Edison was really good at. He did not just invent things. He used to make them uh, marketable, practical, and viable in the market. And that is really the subject of my session today. My name is Nilothpal Das. And people call me Neil. And I'm trying to build a career in the small space between these three circles, engineering excellence, process excellence, and business IT alignment. And someday I wish to push this space big enough so that these three circles converge into one. Uh, I work with Novartis as a lead solution architect. And uh, the mission of Novartis is to care and to cure. We uh, we want to discover, uh, develop, and I'm going to read it out. Sorry. Yeah, we want to discover, develop, and successfully market innovative products and to prevent cure diseases, uh, ease suffering, and enhance the quality of life. That's our mission. Uh, there are disadvantages and advantages of having your <laughs> slot allotted on the second day so late in the conference. Uh, the one disadvantage is that you know, your, your, stun, your thunder is stolen. We've had so many amazing speeches. Almost everything that I wanted to say has already been said. The advantage, though, is that I could never have said the context so well as all the previous speakers have. You know, so all I wanted to say has been so beautifully elaborated, my effort is reduced. So the agenda today is the new world order. I'll try to describe what the new world order is very quickly. And then we'll look at agility, uh, enterprise architecture, and its relationship with innovation. And then uh, I'll talk a little bit about how we bring order to innovation. So you know, we used to uh, depend on the, thun on the bolt from the blue or any new genius ideas for innovation, but that doesn't, that's not going to fly anymore. We need innovation on a deadline, like Thomas Edison started it. And then we'll conclude with an open discussion. Now, I'm not going to talk about anything that I know and you don't know. 
uh, I'm going, I'm, I'm here because I know that there's a lot that you know and I don't know. So my conclusion is going to be about a discussion. It's, I want a good healthy discussion happening here so that I can learn out of this whole exercise. So do you remember your first phone? How many people remember your first phone? Raise your hands please. Okay, what, what, uh, can you go one by one there? Motorola, what about you? Nokia, okay, who else? Right, okay, you, you, how about you? Fingers, yeah, you? Which one? Are, oh, the, ah, see, you stole my thunder. <laughs> so this was the first phone that all of us used uh, for more than 15, 20 years at least. I remember I was five years old when I saw this phone for the first time. I'd gone to my father's office and um, uh, he had this phone there a few days later, a few months later we had a phone like this in our house and things did not change much uh, for the next 15, 20 years or so. We used to pick up the receiver and call somebody up and talk and that's what it was. I mean the dial must have been replaced by a few buttons but more or less it was the same. It was not until I reached college I believe that the first cell phone came around. Uh, in the old days, if I had to take down somebody's number, I would put the receiver under my shoulder like this and write it down the, on the, in the address book. But then the first cell phone came around with the basic features of address book and what have you. And today we are here. This is my phone now, the Nokia Lumia 920, not to advertise it too much, but any phone that you look at these days is extremely advanced. And we don't really just call people with this. In fact, calling people is the minimum thing that we do. I mean, we rarely do it. There's so many other things that we do with this phone. You know, and it's not just the phone. There are so many other smart devices that we see these days, right? There's the tablets, there's the phones, there's the desktops and laptops and all that. And all this uh, enables us to do so many things. There's social, and I'm not going to talk about all that, okay? Social mobility analytics and cloud. We've been talking about it all uh, the last two days about it. And we are completely, constantly connected and we have come a really, really long way all the way from the black dial phone to the beautiful ecosystem that we have created uh, where we have access to information. I remember when I was studying uh, in my uh, early days, uh, I used to buy these books of computer engineering, Oracle Financial, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Oracle Architecture, Win32 Programming, VC++, MSc and so on. And these books used to be very expensive and I was on a budget so I could only buy one book. You know, and I used to go to this bookstore and all morning, all the way till the afternoon, I used to keep reading various options of books that I had so that I could finalize one book that I'm going to buy. But this ecosystem today has given us the opportunity to access information on our phones, on our tablets, whenever we want, wherever we want. And it's a new world. So it looks like we have come a really, really long way, haven't we? Yeah? Think about it. We haven't. Ten years back, we had five million uh, internet connected devices. Uh, today we have 8 billion internet connected devices and this is, in, this is the statistics that I've picked up from a book called Digital Enterprises. It's a beautiful book, you guys should read it if you haven't already. And by 2020 we, have, uh, we will have 50 billion devices which are internet connected because of the internet of things and then it's going to drastically rise to a trillion by 2025, right? So it looks like we barely scratched the surface. We only have mobile devices and gadgets right now. Very soon our refrigerators, like somebody said, is going to start talking to our doorknobs so that they can open the door as the droid brings the milk packets that the refrigerator has automatically ordered and so on, right? It's a, it's a new world order, you know? And, the, and, the, and the, what you see in the picture is a Christopher Scholl's typewriter. It was invented in 1870s, early 1870s. Uh, but this was not the first typewriter ever, okay? This, this typewriter was invented in 1870s and Remington, we were not really focusing on business, innovation and what have you. But that's my whole point. The times are changing and we have to adapt accordingly. Let's talk a little bit about organic growth and complexity. Now I wanted to bring, this, if this would have been a relevant slide if I would have been doing the session early uh, yesterday morning. Because, but this has been talked about a lot, so quickly. A couple of years back, a couple of my friends started a small business. The business was, uh, they were building a product for a niche market. And they were, already, they, they were already doing their jobs and they wanted to do something on the side and probably if it works out then they would leave their jobs and go full time into the business. Now it was just four or five people uh, working on a product 
for a niche market segment. Do you think they had an, an uh, enterprise architecture in the organization? How many people think there is an enterprise architecture in the organization at that time? How many people think there is no enterprise architecture in the organization? Nobody's raising their hands, come on. Okay, you can't be neutral, you've got to take a stand. All right. There was no formal enterprise architecture in their organization, uh, but the enterprise and architecture did exist in the heads of the owners. They knew what their applications are, they knew what their business is, what their market segment is, who their customers are, they knew what information they are working with, they knew what technologies they are going to work with. You know, they knew their roadmap, they knew what they have today, they knew what they are going with, where they are going. But it was simple, right? It was so simple that they didn't even have to write things down on a piece of paper. They could all remember everything. But then, slowly, it started growing. The business started growing, right? They had bigger market segments, so they had to break it down. They hired people. They hired head of marketing for Chennai and Mumbai, and then they started taking tactical decisions how to run their business. And soon these tactical decisions started becoming inefficient because redundancies were created. Because they were taking tactical decisions without considering or you know, consulting each other, right? Which causes inefficiencies and interoperability challenges. Because since the systems that they are using in silos are not designed to talk to each other, very soon they would start realizing that, okay, we need to do something. Then to just make the systems talk to each other, they would have to you know, spend a lot of money. And that is what is happening these days in the, in, the, in the industry. We are spending a lot of money just so that systems can talk to each other. We do not have strategic insight about the various systems that we have. So are you ready? Uh, the business landscape is changing every day, right? Opportunities come up every passing day. I've worked for a, a financial services organization just a couple of years back and I'm now working for a pharma company and uh, I've seen so many opportunities that come up every other day. I went through a merger that in my previous organization which, uh, which I encountered myself and we've recently done something here at Novartis and you know the competition leaves the market, new geographies open up all the time, sorry, all the time. Uh, there are opportunities for cost savings like India opened up about 1991 if I'm not wrong under PV Narasimha Rao when globalization happened. New geographies opened up, new uh, opportunities for cost savings based on uh, uh, foreign exchange differences. So when these things happen, when you want to new st start a new line of business because you've recently acquired a company that has a new business capability or maybe you want to start a new product or a business or a line of service, these are new opportunities that come up, right? Suppose the competition leaves the market. It, it's a green field for the rest of the competitors, right? Who's going to go and capture the market? Is your IT ready to support you to take these opportunities? It's very important. Now there is a lot of people who say that enterprise architecture is architecture of the enterprise and it's not about IT, but I say that information in the enterprises these days are managing, are being managed using IT. IT plays a very, very critical role in the enterprise these days. And somebody just said that we are now on the strategy table and it is high time that we are. If we are not, very soon organizations are going to start to realize that if they do not take IT into consideration, they are going to die. They don't have an option. They are spending so much money on just keeping their IT systems alive because they do not have an IT, a strategic insight, which this, this, all this money could have been used much better in, in doing this, in, doing, uh, in, uh, um, in capturing markets, in increasing turnover. The truth will set you free. The more you know about the enterprise, the quicker you can investigate the impact of change, whenever there is a business landscape change, whenever there is a new opportunity that comes up that you would like to leverage, whenever you would like to look at cost savings or going into a new business or going into a new country or a geography, you would have to look at the impact that it causes, right? Impact on your business, impact on your systems, on your applications. When you want to uh, integrate two companies when there's a merger, you'd have to study the impact of that change. The more you know about yourself, the better you can study the impact. The more you understand the impact, the quicker you can respond. Each cycle of investigation takes you closer to your final goal of near perfect adaptability. And that, so there was this uh, social scientist, social psychologist named Frederick Herzberg who created a two-factor theory. Uh, 
hygiene factor and delighter. So this was all about employee engagement and satisfaction. I'll quickly talk about it. Uh, he's, he came up with two factors. One is the hygiene factor that used to talk about um, an employee would leave the organization if you do not have these things for him. A decent salary, a healthy working environment, an air conditioner for that matter, right? Without these things, you wouldn't even work for an organization anymore. But these things do not motivate you to do an excellent job at your work, right? So hygiene factors are necessary, but they do not motivate or inspire you. On the other hand, there are delighters. Without the delighters, you would continue to work in the organization that you're working. But if you have the delighters, you feel like doing a good job. So I usually use this theory everywhere. You know, so enterprise architecture is absolutely necessary for survival of every organization. And that is a hygiene factor without enterprise architecture, without some form of architecture, in fact, okay? IT architecture I'm talking about, your organization will not be able to uh, face the competition that is coming up these days. Then the delighter is that enterprise architecture harnesses innovation, okay? That is Hercules. We all love heroes, don't we? We like listening to stories where heroes go and, you know, kill seven-headed hydras and what have you. But can we afford a hero? We like to listen to stories and imagine that Nikola Tesla invented the AC current, for example, or Thomas Edison invented the, the incandescent bulb, or Bill Gates created the huge behemoth called Microsoft single-handedly. But truth is not as interesting. Actually, truth is quite boring. Nikola Tesla studied the AC current in his college days. He did not invent it. Does that mean that he did not contribute to it? Sure he did. It was his designs that changed the entire way we look at AC current, right? I always thought that Thomas A. Edison was a geek, a thin guy, uh, uh, I don't know, I mean, in a dark laboratory, you know, and there's a small bulb that is lighting up in front of him. That was the image that I had about Thomas Edison. But that's not the right image. Thomas Edison was a businessman wearing a three-piece suit. He was not the geek that we think he is, right? And, and Bill Gates did not single-handedly create Microsoft. There was a lot more to it. So the point that I'm trying to prove here is that you can't depend on one person or a group of people, group of people I would agree, but one person for innovation. You don't want Hercules working for your organization. What if he leaves? You're left with nothing. What you really need is a process around innovation. Whether somebody stays or goes, innovation should continue. There are innovations and there's ideation. And we've, we've uh, heard some people talk about the difference between innovation and ideation. And so I'll cover that a little bit for here. There's ideation here. So ideation is coming up with ideas, but that itself is not innovation. Like Thomas A. Edison put a process around uh, ideation Idea, uh, innovation requires a process. Secondly, innovation requires the ideas to become practical, marketable, and viable. So there are a lot of ways that you can uh, do ideation in, in your organization. Okay? There was uh, this manager that I used to work with some time back, a long time back really, and uh, sorry about that. Uh, he had come up with a formula, uh, formula to inculcate innovation in, uh, in everyday life. This is a formula of uh, appraisals that he used to do, okay, performance appraisals, all right? So this is D multiplied by E plus I plus X. D stands for delivery. So if delivery is zero, everything else is zero. Nothing means, I mean, everything else doesn't have any value at all. If delivery is two, then the value of everything else doubles. So he used to give prime importance to delivery. delivery. Then I, oh sorry, E stands for engineering excellence. He keeps engineering excellence before innovation uh, on purpose, okay? Last year's innovation, if you uh, execute last year's innovation this year, it's engineering excellence. So you get brownie points for that, okay? So that innovations don't die out. You innovate something this year, you forget about it next year, doesn't make sense. So last year's innovation is this year's engineering excellence. And this year's engineering excellence is next year's delivery. So you have to deliver that next year, okay? And then I stands for innovation. There are two types of innovation that you used to call it, although I don't think that is innovation. I think that is ideation. But still, there are two types of innovation in his view. There's business or customer-focused innovation, and then there's technology innovation. I used to, this is from Microsoft. I used to work at Microsoft back then, and they put a lot of value to uh, uh, technology innovation. And then X was a manager's prerogative. So if your behavior and everything is very nice, he would give you extra brownie points. So uh, one 
system of ideation. Another is there's a lot of ideation frameworks that are available in the market these days. So um, we had an ideation framework in my previous organization we had come up with. It's basically a system of putting a group of people into a room and giving them a business problem and then discussing the various ideas that they can come up with. They would have three or four tables so that the group is not really big and it doesn't create a commotion. And then, uh, and then you rate these ideas and the lower ideas are filtered out and then you start bringing the groups together with a smaller set of ideas and compare them with each other and finally come up with two or three ideas. So that's another uh, way of coming up with new ideas. The third one is crowdsourcing. We have, uh, uh, we have this here in, my, in our organization Novartis as well. There's something called an idea farm and uh, we farm ideas from uh, all the employees and then two or three ideas uh, there are giveaway iPads or what have you every year. Right? So these ideas, the two or three ideas are selected and then they are executed and they are basically tested on various levels. And then finally there are idea, ideation workshops. So we used to do uh, quarterly ideation workshops in my previous organization where uh, we didn't specifically have any business problem that we are trying to solve. And that is the difference between ideation frameworks and ideation workshops, right? In ideation fr frameworks, you have a business problem that you're trying to solve using generating ideas. In ideation workshops, what we used to do is we didn't specifically have any business problem. We would go and sit down in a room and start talking about the pain points that the senior management is facing at the moment and then first come up with a pain point that we would like to solve, we, we would like to you know, take care of and then based on that we would do the ideation framework. Okay? So, and if you do this on a regular basis, there's putting a little bit of process around ideation. Right? The next thing that I'm going to do is we'll look at the TOGAF ADM as an innovation framework. I do this again and again, oh, sorry. So uh, I'm going to present a, a, a case study, um, not a real case study though. Okay, maybe not so unreal either because you see this in so many organizations these days. Uh, this is an application communication diagram which is so very common uh, across so many enterprises that I've seen in my life. Uh, these are various applications talking to each other and what this creates is uh, vendor dependency. So these are COTS applications and uh, uh, commercially of the shelf applications and the problem is if you would like to eliminate or replace one application with some new application, it's a nightmare because now you'll have to study so many interfaces, so many, so many other applications that are talking to them. You don't even know what are the other applications that are talking to this if they're not properly documented and usually these things happen organically, right? You have a couple of applications and then these applications are willing to increase the number of features that they have. So suppose you have a portfolio management application and it says it, it, it starts doing something which is not portfolio management related and because just because it wants to increase its footprint into the organization. And then slowly what happens is you're doing way too many things with just one application and it happens organically across various teams. So you don't have a very clear idea about what each application is doing and what are the other applications that it is talking to which basically creates a vendor dependency because now you can't get rid of that vendor because you, you don't know what's the impact. So in one of the ideation workshops, let's say, they come up with this pain, problem, pain point for the senior, senior management that we have vendor dependency or we have application dependency and we don't have a very clear idea about what's the impact of stuff, right? So vision, everybody knows this diagram. It's, uh, what is it? What is this diagram? Can somebody tell me? Pardon me? No, not the right one. I'm talking, uh, not that one, this one. Pardon me? Yes, hub and spoke, you can call that, but there's more. Look at, look at it closely. Can you read what's written? And? Yeah, so what is it? Data, no, it's not data warehousing. This is service oriented architecture. You've got a service layer in the middle, which is the data transport layer. It's not, doesn't have to be a service layer. It could be an orchestration engine for you. So uh, for, for, for all you know. So it's basically simplifying the entire diagram that you saw here into this. You have a, 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 a data transport layer based on universal standards and all the applications talk to that layer. And now if you want to eliminate one application and replace it with another, all you have to do is take care of one interface. 
Now this is one of the business problems that came, came up. Is this an innovation? It's not really because this is just an idea. We haven't really studied this idea whether it's practical, whether, it, whether it's viable, whether it's marketable, we don't know. Right? So the first thing that we would have to look at is the business impact of this idea. Right? So do the business goals and drivers change? Because the organization has annual business goals. Are they going to change if we implement this idea? What, are they, what is the impact that it's going to have on the business processes? Okay? What's the impact that it's going to have the people? The people who are accessing the applications today, are they going to change some? Is this, is this going to change something there? Right? The people who are going to implement this idea, is their life going to change at all? Okay? And the most important thing, what is the business value that, that this idea adds? What is the return of investment? Because this idea, you can't execute it free of cost, right? It's going to take some investment, some money, some time, some resources. So what is the return of investment on this idea? And then uh, applications. So it's still not innovation. You still have to look at what are, what are the changes in the application interfaces that are going to happen. Okay? What are the new applications that we are going to introduce? Are we going to introduce, use the same applications? Now that we are changing things, why not take a look at if we can replace some old applications with the new ones? Right? What, are the, what is the impact on the information flow? Upstream systems, downstream systems, how is the information going to change in format or what have you? Are we going to upgrade those? This is still not an innovation because we still haven't looked at the technology. There are going to be technology changes, upgrades. We've been using old technology for so many years simply because we don't know what's the impact it's going to have if we upgrade it. We are so afraid and life in these days I see, uh, I was having a conversation with a very good friend of mine here in Bangalore. I met, I've met him after many years. He's a good friend, childhood friend. And we were talking about this. We are led, with fear, led by fear so often these days. Every part of our, of our life is led by fear. It's the same thing in the organizations. We are afraid to touch our applications and our technology simply because we don't know what the impact is. And enterprise architecture relieves you from that fear because you have information about, about your systems. Right? So are there going to be any upgrades? Are we going to decommission something? And then we'll ha we won't be, this is a big change, by the way. It's not a small change. Even if you don't do the whole uh, enterprise, because there will be, say, let's say, two and, I don't know, 2,000 applications, depending, depending upon the size of the organization. This is just a very small picture. But uh, 2000, changing 2,000 applications and converting the whole thing into service-oriented architecture is a big thing. Let's say even if you don't do the whole thing, let's say you take a very small subsystem of let's say 15 applications or 10 applications for that matter. It's still a really big change. Okay, it could be a five year plan for all you know. All right? So you can't do everything right away. Right? You'll have to plan it, you'll have to prioritize it, you'll have to see what are the various applications that are dependent on each other and based on that you'll prioritize. You'll have to align with the PMO, that is important, because you're not going to execute the projects and they're not sitting there twiddling their thumbs all day long thinking about what's the enterprise architecture team going to give me next. Right? They have their line of business plans, they have worked with the senior management in coming up with what they are going to do and the business. And this all brings us back to the reporting structure. How is the reporting structure? Now there are main various organizations in this world and there are different types of reporting structures that you have. The, the project management team sometimes report into the business directly. Not always do they report into the CIO, right? Sometimes they have dotted line reporting into the CIO. Sometimes they have direct reporting into the CIO. So based on, depending upon what kind of alignment you have, you'll have to start prioritizing your service-oriented ar architecture project with them. They don't report into you. They've got other things to do in life, right? Again, I did it, okay. And then, uh, then uh, there is the ivory tower problem, right? So. Uh, People say that enterprise architects are, architects are sitting there in the ivory tower. They don't know what's happening in this world. They don't know how we execute our projects. We hear this all the time. The project teams always say this. There is a big disconnect between the enterprise architects and the uh, project teams. Governance is what brings us down, brings the enterprise architects down from their ivory, ivory tower. When they govern the applications, when they come and see how enterprise architecture is being executed, right? they will realize what are the problems that the project teams are facing on a day-to-day -day basis. They will realize that whether the plans that they are giving, the architecture they are building, are they relevant to the enterprise, to the project teams or not. It is this governance that makes enterprise architecture relevant. And then change, 
the business landscape is not the world has not stood still after you started design designing your application if there are any changes you'll have to take a look at it back to innovation what is innovation innovation is not coming up with ideas innovation is looking at idea, coming up with ideas and looking at it from the business standpoint from the application standpoint from the technology standpoint innovation is coming up with ideas and making them marketable practical and viable with that i'll open it up for discussion let's talk yeah go for it sorry mike here can you uh behind you behind you uh, there is a quote there i don't know the who has quoted it but they say <clears throat> a researcher is a person who sees what others have seen but it thinks what others have not thought thank you very much excellent quote anybody else yeah Mm -hmm. very valid in our organization also so how do you overcome that like, uh, when uh, you see that because when we prepare the architecture and uh, there is always some gap when it comes for the exhibition like normally like six months or one year and they uh, come out all this it won't work and the project team come to the meeting come they say it won't work they are so many issues and all those things so what are the best ways to address these type of uh, things all right uh it's a very interesting question so uh, governance right uh reviews now in many organizations what happens is the reviews happen only once once the project has uh, done the what do you call the project charter when they submit their project charter the architecture uh, team reviews it and sees whether everything is in order or not whether it's meeting the future state uh, 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 road map or not whether the technology blueprint is being adhered to or not and so on they'll review it and then they'll say okay approved and then they forget about it all right now the project teams go and start executing these and that's when they start realizing the pain points of what's the i mean with the technology blueprint right or whatever is has been the principles and the guidelines so they start taking deviations but the architecture team doesn't know right and when the project comes back it's there's a big variance the only way that this can happen is when a primary architect is assigned to every single project now there are various types of projects in an organization there are development projects there are operate operations projects or what have you but wherever required i mean i would say that enterprise architecture is an art and a science okay so i leave this to the good judgment of the architects but every uh, uh, project that requires regular reviews they should be assigned a primary architect and that primary architect should run with the project throughout the entire life cycle of the project all the way till closure when that happens enterprise architecture stays relevant because then at regular milestones whether it's quarterly or half yearly the enterprise architect sits down with the project manager and talks about the project it will be at a high level obviously and then i think there should be technical architects and you know i don't know how what they call it there are various designations tactical architects or what have you who will work with their day to day tactical problems but my uh, milestone reviews are uh, the only way that an enterprise i mean a good way there are other ways as well that an enterprise architecture team can stay relevant does that answer your question sure sure please there is something called as the technical design authority it yes. is part of the enterprise architecture you have a technical design authority and you have technical design architects being part of the team so how it drives is a chief architect and a chief enterprise architect we'll have a team of technical design authorities who will be designated for all these projects so once a, suppose if it is a maintenance project when a cr comes in this person will try to see what is the business requirement then the system impact the functional impact application impact then the operational impact okay then there is an um, um, a risk uh, what is called a raid rid right risk and uh, what is the dependency what is the impact and then uh, so these this aspect will be covered as part of the tda documentation so once this go it will be going to the next person who is a specialist he will be coming back to the tda to come up with uh, okay this is the design i'm going to do on there is an impact on this particular database 
and then what, that is approved, the TDA says, okay, this is approved. Then it goes to the developer, but TDA is still working with the developers to see that, okay, till this goes to the production, it is the responsibility of the TDA for the uh, that it aligns with the business requirement as well as to the conformance to the enterprise architecture. Right. And that's a yeah. There are a couple of, uh, here, there are a couple of comments I want to add, which sure. uh, is, uh, uh, in our organization, like, uh, we ha have a delivery architecture's role. Probably if we uh, have a multi-million projects, whatever the model that you propose probably will work. But one other reason when we w execute a project which is in a continuous improvement or legacy mode or trying some new technologies, probably uh, these uh, delivery architects who's on ground along with the developers who has a collaboration with the EA would uh, certainly help and that helps us in terms of uh, to adhere to the standards. Yeah, it does help to solve the tactical problems, but then how will you align it with the enterprise architecture and the solution architecture at the high level? So that's where it's important that the enterprise architect remains uh, uh, aligned. So at Novartis, uh, uh, add one more point, similar to what he said, uh, technical design authority, we have something called an architecture handbook. So it's, a, it's called a handbook because you hold it in your hand, it's not really a book, all right? It's a, a, a word document, really large word document, but that document is filled out, not upfront in the project. As we go along and cross each and every milestone, as new information is revealed, that uh, uh, document needs to be filled out as a part of uh, one of the regulatory norms, right? So. Uh, so the enterprise architect, the solution architect, and the project teams stay alignment using that architecture handbook as a tool. Any other questions or just uh, just or a quotes, comment, discussions, uh, ideas? Yeah. Just a comment on. Uh -huh. so for example, there may be some uh, innovation like open source uh, this thing or uh, some framework, spring framework. They are not uh, related to any. Uh, monetary value, or, but still they are, there are innovations. Why we have to see innovation only from a business and monetary aspect? Because everything that we do in our organization is around business. Now, the point is, sometimes you give back to the society, like I'm here speaking. It's, well, this is a give and take, to be honest. Okay, I'm learning. I'm learning as much as I can. I'm very selfish when it comes to this, all right? But the point is that it's, uh, when I speak, there is something that I will give to give back to the community, and there's a lot that the community will give back to me. And this is a give and take. So once in a while, doing something, uh, even if you do do something, uh, something such as this, which does not have a direct business impact, in the long term it does. And I'll tell you why. It's very simple. At this point in time, like uh, uh, Steve gave his presentation about branding, uh, it's very important that we brand ourselves. Because organizations do not have this awareness that enterprise, how much enterprise architecture can impact them. And I think that it is a social cause almost that the uh, enterprises know the impact that enterprise architecture can do. So if you contribute to the, to the community as a whole without the direct business impact that you have, it still has a long-term business impact. So to be very honest, I think it's all about the business. All right. <laughs> Whether it's short-term or long-term, that's a different story. Yeah, I think uh, my comment was around the same thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Just wanted to share one more equation similar to your D. <laughs> Multiplied by E plus I plus X? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this is from a colleague of mine, like uh, in invention plus application equal to innovation. Right, right. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much.